Well, good morning, everybody. Great to welcome you again to our worship services online. I always invite you to come out and be with us uh, out in Williamson County. Uh, we're at Esperanza Church at 11 o'clock every Sunday, and uh, we'd love to have you. We're outdoor worship. It's totally safe, and uh, it's quick, and love to have you to do that. But today we're going to be looking at the book of James again. We're going to be looking at chapter 3, beginning in verse 13 through 18. And so you can get your Bibles out. And I'm going to begin with a word of prayer. Our band's going to come, and then I'll be right back with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day of worship. And we pray that you'll bless us and open our hearts and minds to your truth today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, that you are my portion, you are my hiding place, I believe you are the way, the truth.
Well, I hope you have your Bibles open and I hope you'll keep them open to, uh, today as we look at uh, something I think is very important. In fact, when I read this text of Scripture, James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, I almost feel like I'm reading the newspaper. I almost feel like I'm watching the news on television or looking at my phone and catching the latest headlines because it speaks about the fallacy of worldly wisdom, the fallacy of the world's way of thinking and doing things, and, and earthly wisdom versus heavenly wisdom. And so let me read this for us today, and then we'll, we'll make some uh, comments on, on, on the passage. A very exciting, very exciting passage. Verse 13, James chapter 3. Who among you is wise in understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and gentleness of wisdom, but... If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be so arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not from which comes above, from that, down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed, whose fruit is righteousness, is sown in peace by those who make peace. I tell you, James gets right after it, doesn't he? And what he's basically saying is, uh, is there anybody that says that they're wise and they sort of have some expertise in life? Well, he says, if they do, they can show it uh, by the way they uh, live and the way they act. In fact, he kind of comes back to this recurring theme that he has begun in the book. Theme number one is, is that if you have legitimate faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's going to translate into proven character, which is going to translate in the right kind of deeds. And the second thing that he says is, if you have the right kind of character and the right kind of faith, your relationships are going to be good. In fact, I think James would go, if he could be right here with us today, I think he would say that relationships are one of the most important things in our lives. And I believe he would go so far as to say they are sacred. Relationships are sacred. So whatever wisdom we have, they should build relationships and build people up. And they should keep us from doing the things that would be selfish on our part. And in addition to all of that, they should lead us to minister to people and to love people and do well by people all the days of our lives. And that's what true faith in Christ really and truly is. You know, he talks about faith without doubting. It's unwavering faith. And he talks about a faith that works. This is one of the themes in this book, the faith that works in works. It actually does something. And he talks about uh, testing people or, or treating people rather without any discrimination at all. You remember in a previous chapter, he said, when the, the wealthy person comes in, you treat that person exactly like you would the poorest person. Don't discriminate against anyone. Faith has a way of working itself out and treating people with equanimity, treating people the right way, the right the way they ought to be treated. And then he goes on to say, there's a wisdom that runs through the church from time to time, and it's very dangerous because it's worldly wisdom, earthy, he says. And there's a wisdom that comes from God that actually builds the church and draws people together and at the end helps everybody because people are doing the right things, they're doing it in the right way, and they're doing good things to build up people inside the walls of the church and also outside the walls of the church. So he asked a question. It's a rhetorical question. He said, who among you, he says in verse 13, is wise and understanding? That's kind of interesting. The word wise is a very interesting thing. It says a, w a wise person can see things clearly, any situation clearly or whatever, and then act accordingly. That's a wise person. A wise person sees the, the, the difficulties at, at, on the job or the difficulties in family. And then he knows or she knows what to do recognizes it, understands it, uh, you know, can, can see it for what it is, and then brings the right action and solution with the right attitude to fix that. And then this idea of being understanding, he says, who is wise in understanding? That's a very unique word there. It means who is really intelligent, but it's also the word that's sometimes used in this language, sometimes used to mean an expert. I wonder if James is putting a little barb in here to his readers, and he says, I want to know who's wise, who thinks they're wise, and who's an expert in congregational life, 
Who's an expert in religious things? Who's an expert in faith and following Jesus Christ? He said, if you are, then some things would never be named among you. And if you, uh, uh, if you really are, are truly following Christ and your faith is issuing forth in works, then there's some things that will always be uh, named among you or characteristic among you. I think that's very important. Wisdom, he's saying, is proven by a behavior and our attitude towards others. Wisdom, true wisdom that comes from above, acknowledges God and our relationship with Him, and then it acknowledges others and our relationship with other people, and we are not selfish about that. We don't hold on to that. We don't use people, and we don't abuse people. That's what he's trying to say here. So let's look at the Scripture again. Follow along as I read here. He says, Let him show by his good behavior and deeds and gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. He said, this is the kind of wisdom that comes not from above, but he said, is earthly, is natural, is natural wisdom, he says, and is natural and demonic. He says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder in every evil thing. Let's think about earthly or natural wisdom. I'm reminded of what Paul said about man's wisdom in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. Listen to this, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. He says, the, for, the, for the word of God is, the, is the, uh, the word of the cross, rather, is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then he says this, I will, that God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever uh, I will set aside. Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater? Has, God, uh, not, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this age and the wisdom of this world? So we already understand that there's a wisdom that comes from heaven or is heavenly, and there's a wisdom of the earth, and the wisdom of the earth will never ever allow us to have the right kind of character to do what we need to do when we need to do it and to do the right things. So I think that's very important. So Paul says, I mean, J James says, as he writes here, he said, this earthly wisdom is characterized by a number of things. First of all, it's characterized, the foundation of this wisdom is characterized by really bitter jealousy. Bitter jealousy. The word jealous in the New Testament comes from a word we use in English called zealous. And it means to boil. So this bitterness boils over in a person's life. You know, there's a difference between jealousy and envy, although they're very close. When I'm jealous, I'm jealous of something I want or something I have. I don't want anybody else to want that. I don't want anybody else to get that. I don't want anybody else to have that. I don't want anybody else to take that away from me. When I'm envious with a bitter envy, I want what somebody else has. I desire, I covet what they have. I want what they have and I can't get and it creates bitterness, and I begin to use and abuse people trying to get it. I talk about them. I abuse them. Maybe I don't promote them like I should. I don't speak to them. I'm not friendly with them. I don't do anything for them when I have the occasion. And Paul says, this earthly wisdom says, look out for yourself because nobody else will. Nobody else is going to look out for yourself, so you better look out for yourself and get what you want, and it doesn't matter how you get it. And jealousy eventually will cause a person to be bitter. Envy will eventually cause a person to be bitter. You can't avoid it. If you have jealousy in your heart, you'll be, end up being bitter over that. And he says that's one of the foundations there. And then you begin to be resentful. You resent everybody else's success. You resent the success of the good people and the success of the bad people and everybody in between. You want what they have. You want what they've achieved. You want the recognition that they're gaining. And, and you begin to be resentful of people. You can resent your kids. You can resent your spouse. You can resent the people that are trying to help you the most because you have this bitterness in your heart and this bitterness in your life. And then he says, another foundation of, of this worldly wisdom is selfish ambition. Selfish ambition. Now listen, I don't think it's wrong to be ambitious. I don't think it's wrong to say, I want to do better uh, in my education or get education so I can do better. I want to do better in my job. I want to get this skill to make me better. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But why would you want to get better? 
If it's just a selfishness there that promotes you above everybody else, you're not helping anybody. If you're climbing over people and pushing people out of the way to get to your dreams, then you're nearly not helping them. And that's the world's wisdom. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, God will set aside that kind of wisdom. That kind of wisdom is destructive. That kind of wisdom can't help but fail. Here's what, here's what James says about it. First of all, he says it's natural. Look in verse 15 with me. The wisdom that, that is not, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly and natural. It means it's unspiritual is what he's saying here. Unspiritual wisdom means that it doesn't come from God. It's never going to be blessed by God. It's never going to be used by God. God doesn't want it at all. If I'm selfish and all of my ambition is for what I want, and I use anybody and everything and anyone and use every kind of uh, resource that I have, I'll push and shove and steal and claw and bite and whatever else to get what I want. That is unspiritual wisdom. We'll get to spiritual wisdom in just a moment. And then he goes to say it's demonic. Wow, do you see that? He says it's natural, it's demonic, it's devilish. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that it comes not from heaven, but from hell. It's something that the devil uses as his instrument to get us to fail. Because it's sinful to be selfish, then everything we do as a selfish person is sin. And sin never gets any better. It always gets worse. And it begins to spread out like a virus. And it takes a bunch of people with us. And it's just absolutely destructive. That's the third thing that he says. It is destructive. Notice what he says. He says, in every evil thing, it, it, every evil thing. Oh my goodness. He said, it's, it's no good. He said, for, in verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. It's devilish and there's disorder. That's another word for anarchy. Isn't that interesting? Anarchy. We got a lot of anarchists in our time right now. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. There's a total lack of respect for authority and whatever. And what James would say to us today is we better watch our hearts because if we follow the path of selfishness, if we follow the path of bitterness, if we follow the path of jealousy and envy, ultimately it's going to cause anarchy and it will eventually destroy us. It will eventually destroy us because it creates evil and it creates disorder Listen, if you want to destroy your family, just be selfish. If you want to destroy your career, just be selfish. You can have all the skill in the world for anything. And you can have all the knowledge about any subject, and more knowledge than anybody has. But if it never does anybody any good, if you're never able to take that knowledge, take that power, take your position, and use it for the benefit of all people, or the benefit of at least someone else in your life, then you're going to destroy everything you touch eventually. It will eventually eat you up. Bitterness will eat you up. Jealousy will. Envy will. It'll just eat you up. Ultimately, selfishness, selfishness is sinful, and it will totally eat you up. So these roots of self-centeredness don't just destroy us, but they destroy relationships. If I'm envious of somebody, I'm never going to have a good relationship with them. If I'm jealously guarding something that I think somebody wants from me, I'm never going to have a good relationship with them. If I have selfish ambition and I'm stepping over everybody or pushing everybody aside, I'm never going to serve them unless it meets my ends and my needs. We destroy relationships. And there's one thing about a believer. A believer is brought into the family of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are brought into a fellowship with Christ and we are brought into a fellowship with the people of Christ, the body of Christ. And so we can't destroy relationships by holding an orthodoxy, the right kind of faith that never builds relationships or never ministers to another person or can never be used by God to do something beyond ourselves. These are these destructive things that go on in the world today. I think about the world's wisdom and how the world's wisdom generally leads us to war or anarchy. It leads us to incredible debt in our country, incredible student debt that people can hardly ever get out of, divorce and abortion and all these kind of things. That's the world's wisdom. That's the world's wisdom. 
addictions and all these kind of things, thinking that I can get away with this, I'll be all right with this. No, those things destroy. But when Jesus Christ comes into our lives and saves us by his grace and mercy, by his death, burial, and resurrection, and we get a new heart and a new life, things begin to change, and we receive from God not worldly wisdom, not worldly wisdom that's just better, but we receive wisdom from heaven that doesn't even look like anything in the world. It doesn't seem wise to turn the other cheek and go the second mile. It doesn't seem very wise to forgive somebody 70 times 7. It doesn't seem very wise to be kind to all people and gentle with people. It doesn't seem wise to do that because we grow up with a natural uh, proclivity, I guess, or natural tendency to be selfish. But once Jesus Christ takes that selfishness away, we begin to see the world like God sees it. We begin to understand why God sent his son into the world to die for the world. And when you begin to see people as God sees people, your whole life changes and a new reality comes into your life. And James is trying to say just this. Notice what this heavenly, heavenly wisdom looks like. It says, the wisdom from above is first pure. Pure, no mixed motives there. No division there, pure. No guile. Then he goes on to say, it's peaceable. That is in relationships with people, instead of dividing in those relationships, they're actually peaceable. They're, it's gentle, it's reasonable, it's full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. Peaceable means it promotes peace and creates peace. When you look at the word of God, gentle means you forbear people. That is, you have patience with people. You're kind to people. You, you watch people struggle instead of condemning them and judging them. You understand them. And you want to help them and try to minister to their needs. He goes on to say something very important here. Reasonable. It's open to the views of others. When I'm selfish, I don't want to hear anybody else's views. When I've made up my mind, I don't care about what anybody else says. But when I'm led by the Spirit of God and I've given the peace of God that passes understanding, then I'm willing to be a listener. I'm willing to say, you know what? I was wrong about this. You know what? That is a, that's really a great idea. That, that's really something that I need in my life. I think we all have this tendency to say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to listen to anybody else. But a man who has godly wisdom, a woman who's blessed with godly wisdom, a young person, a young adult blessed with godly wisdom says, listen, I want to know the wisdom of God. And if it comes from that person or that group or whatever, I want it in my life. I'm willing to listen. I'm going to be reasonable about this. It's merciful. It has compassion that actually helps somebody. It's not a sentiment. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm really sorry for those people over there, but they don't do anything about it. That's nothing but a sentiment. That's sentimental. When you're merciful, you extend that mercy. You find a way to be merciful to somebody. You don't just extend it in a sentimentality that just drips with a, a languor and, you oh, I'm so sorry and I wish it would be better. No, no, you find a way to go help that person and be merciful to them. These good fruits, it begins to do good things. The wisdom from above leads us to the right kind of action. That's what James is talking about. Faith without works is dead, but true faith leads you to be not only merciful, but begins to, you begin to have good fruit in your life. Jesus Christ said, I've chosen you that you might bear fruit and your fruit would remain. Isn't that great? That he, we would bear the good fruits of righteousness. It's unwavering. It doesn't go one way one day and one day the next day, one way the next day. It's not hypocritical. You love people because you love them. I'm not trying to use them. I'm not trying to get something out of them. It, it, it's, it's not hypocritical. You wear your faith gently and kindly. You wear it out there on your sleeve. You let everybody look at your life because you're living for God and living for others. And you've experienced the freedom that Jesus Christ died and was resurrected to give us. True freedom to live according to the truth. It's so incredibly important. It seeks the welfare of others. This is the wisdom that comes from above. It always seeks the welfare of others. It builds relationships with others. It also does the right things the right way for the right reasons. You know, wisdom from above is a gift. It's a gift of God. James says in the first chapter, if anyone lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally. We need wisdom. We don't have it of ourselves. It's in God's possession, not in ours. And we need to receive it as a gift. We need it every day and we need it in every step of every day. 
in every moment of every day to ask God for his wisdom as we make decisions or we listen or we help or whatever we do, we need the wisdom of God rather than to turn to our own selfish ways, which is so easy to do. We need God's wisdom. We need, to, we need it as a gift from him and we need to receive it every day from him and we re need to receive it with thanksgiving and joy. Listen to this in verse 18. And the seed which the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I don't know what all the world needs today, but I know it would do well if it had peace and to have peace, it needs peacemakers. Not people who make superficial peace, but people like you and me, believers in Jesus Christ, who could be the peacemakers of this world and bring peace in this generation. The peace of God as we witness to people. The peace of God as we serve people. The peace of God as we teach and disciple people. And the peace of God as we live it out. Let's remember what James says. If we're wise and we're experts, let's be experts in the wisdom that comes from above. And let that wisdom do something in the name of Christ and for the benefit of all around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this lesson. Thank you for this scripture. Thank you for this opportunity. And we would long for the peace that comes beyond understanding because it comes from above. We want that, Lord. We want to be peacemakers. And we pray this and ask this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. The band's going to come. I'll be right back. I heard a thousand stories of why they think you're alive, but I heard the tender whisper of love. In the dead of night and he told me that you're pleased and that I am never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know that we're all searching for answers. Only you can provide, because you know. What we need before we can say a word You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am
It's so good to worship with you today. I just love being with the people of God. I love the Word of God. I know you do too, or you wouldn't be a part of this. So I hope you'll have a great week. I'm going to be praying for you. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me that as a pastor and a leader of our church, that I would always live out of heavenly wisdom? Every decision made, every word spoken, every time we're leading and doing anything, would you just pray that that would be a part of our lives? my life and your life. I'll pray the same for you. Have a great week and we'll see you next week. God bless you.